Well, it's a, it's a great honour to be uh, speaking here this afternoon and to try and give some reflections and perspectives on frontotemporal dementia, uh, particularly the last uh, 10 years uh, in Sydney. Um, many of you know um, that when I'm back in the UK, I spend a lot of time making pots. So I thought some people might like to see some pictures of a few of my pots, which I've <laughs> sprinkled into the talk in case people get a bit bored and uh, their mind wanders during uh, presentation. So um, in Cambridge, we were really doing cognitive work across a, a range of neuros, uh, of degenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, FTD. But FTD became more and more of a, uh, a, a, of a passion of mine, and we established a specialist clinic in Cambridge. Uh, and when I decided to um, relocate to Sydney, we decided to make FTD the focus of our uh, interest and to take advantage of the pathology. And as Glenda said, I'd already spent 2002 here and had a very productive uh, year and, uh, and met Olivier. And uh, when I moved to Neura, uh, there was also strong genetics. Uh, and so we we focused on FTD as the central disease with a number of research strands related to that. Um, the biology, the pathology, clinical progression, um, and the impact of the disease on carers. So we've tried to do broad ranging research, which really fits into um, using FTD as a model of cognition to understand things about memory, language, and um, social cognition. Uh, I'm not going to say so much about that today. I'm really going to talk more about our, the, the, our research on FTD itself, the disease. Um, and uh, we have collectively, between us, published 400 papers over the last uh, uh, 10 years on this uh, disease. And so, um, right from the beginning, we, we didn't know how many patients we were going to get, actually, and uh, where they would come from. So we thought, well, we better get maximum information out of each one and also give them a good time when they came uh, and uh, so that they're keen to come back and spread the word. And uh, so when I moved, Lenda said there were only five of us. Uh, one of them was fortunately Aneda Miyoshi, who will feature later in the talk, as an occupational therapist who now has a chair in the um, University of East Anglia, and she led the sort of carer um, side of the, of the research and made sure we sort of looked after the families. But we, we collected very consistent data of family history, um, issues to do with the caregiver, their observations on behavior. All the patients underwent a structured neurological examination neuropsych testing, um, imaging, uh, blood taking, and we put all that information straight away onto a database so that it was accessible. And as soon as we had enough patients, we would be able to start accessing this uh, database and writing papers. So in the last uh, 10 years or 11 years now, we've assessed 963 subjects who have come along, um, initially to Neura, and then uh, almost two years ago, we, we moved to University of Sydney. Um, and uh, we've seen some controls and some AD patients. And we, we're almost at 500 FTD. Um, so you can see the breakdown there. So we've seen almost 500 people with a frontotemporal dementia or re closely related syndrome, which is 1,800 visits and 1,400 scans. And to date, we have... Uh, 116 brains of people who've, we've seen, with another 109 signed up. Glenda has already shown the research group, and of course, you know, the, the research I'm going to talk about has been done in collaboration with a broad range of outstanding young colleagues who've, who've uh, led this work. Um, and I haven't, I haven't. I'm not able to talk about all of it, so it's, it's, this is very selective. Um, one area that we've been interested in, when, when I moved to Neura, uh, Matthew Keenan was at the hospital uh, just up the road, 
and had one of the sort of leading MND clinics in Australia. And of course, everyone here will know there's a considerable overlap between FTD and motor neuron disease, clinically, pathologically, and genetically. And uh, the genetic link wasn't known when we started, but I have worked closely with Matthew over the years, and uh, James, who I was very pleased to see, and Patricia, who will be here next week from Chile, were the early research fellows who looked into this overlap between FTD and MND, and that research has grown considerably. You know, we've looked at the motor side of FTD and the behavioral side of MND and developed questionnaires and looked at imaging, and so that, that work has really flourished, which culminated in us being invited to write a review in The Lancet um, a couple of years ago summarizing ours and other people's work, which James led. So, FTD. Um, I'm orientating this towards the clinical questions that emerge when we see a new family um, who come for assessment. And these questions are lingering in their mind and, uh, you know, invariably pop out in some way during the assessment. Um, they want to know, you know, uh, are their kids going to get it? Um, how bad is it? What's the outcome? You know, how long are they going to be at home? What's the prognosis? Is there any treatment? And uh, also, I put kind of why me, but you know, that's a question we don't know about most diseases other than the genetics, so uh, I can't really go there. But before we embark on discussions with our patients about prognosis and genetics, we need to be confident that they actually have FTD to begin with. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Now, frontotemporal dementia is an umbrella term that covers a group of conditions. Um, unlike Alzheimer's disease, which has a fairly unitary presentation with a few variants, and the pathology, it doesn't matter if you, you know, you're young, old, it, it, it's a singular pathology. Um, in FTD, we're faced with a very complex disease because there are a number of presentations. Some people present with behavioral changes predominantly, which we call behavioral variant FTD, and others present with language problems, uh, which we call progressive aphasia. They divide even further. Uh, and some of the early work that Glenda and I did, based on brains from Cambridge, uh, combined with brains from Sydney, you know, with the foundations of, of the clinico-pathological correlates, which have expanded since then. So there's the clinical level at the top and the syndromes, but the underlying pathology that we see in these people is very variable. Some of them have predominantly tau deposition in the brain. Others have this other protein, TDP43, a small proportion have fuss, and some people that we've called FTD actually have Alzheimer uh, pathology. Uh, and a lot of work has gone into trying to establish the correlation between these clinical syndromes and the underlying pathology and seeing whether we can get better at predicting the pathology uh, for when drugs do become available that can modify those pathologies and then we'll know who to give which drugs to. And a further level of complexity, so we've got the clinical classification, the pathological classification, and each of the pathologies can be due to a gene defect. So it's a very complex disease to be trying to uh, work on. Um, about a half of the patients present with behavioral changes. So this is behavioral variant um, FTD. Uh, and one of the important sort of contributions in the area was an international group, um, which Olivier and I were part of, that came up with diagnostic or revised clearer diagnostic criteria. So these are patients who present usually oblivious to their symptoms themselves, which means they present rather late, um, with a combination of disinhibition, being socially inappropriate behavior, impulsive, rash, spending money, sexual disinhibition, apathy and inertia, 
loss of sympathy and care for others, over um, perseverative ritualized behaviors, overeating, and problem solving. Uh, the ones I've put in red are because those are the ones that I consider to be more unique to um, FTD rather than other diseases like Alzheimer's. And each of them we've investigated extensively their neural basis, how to measure these um, things in people. And the, the criteria for FTD is that if you got three of these symptoms early in the course of the disease, um, you, you fulfill possible. But if your brain looks abnormal on scanning, and it's definitely a progressive disorder, then you can move up to probable. And you're definite if your brain, if you have a genetic defect or pathology. Um, so those are, the, those are the criteria. And quite a lot of patients present with the possible category. But um, how certain can we be about the diagnosis? So um, a couple of years now, we felt we had enough patients of our own that we'd been seeing and following to look at these criteria. So Emma Devonay um, did some important research following up people that had come to the clinic and even on their first assessment, we'd said, oh, they're probable. They've got the symptoms, they've got the imaging, it's progressive. And we had 39 of them with three years of uh, follow-up. And um, after three years, 20 of them were still probable, and three had developed motor neuron disease. So that illustrates the overlap between FTD and motor neuron disease. Another 17 had become definite because they'd either died and we got pathology, or we had genetic information which had revealed um, a, a genetic mutation. And, and as I said earlier, the pathology, that's just four cases. I'm sure there are more of those who are dead now. Even four of them, the pathology is quite varied. And the, the gene defect, so we have quite a few of these patients with genetic defects, but 13 out of 39, so a third of the group have a gene defect. So that illustrates the importance of genetics in FTD. But even in our expert, supposedly hands and you know, state-of-the-art investigations, there are still two uh, people that we called FTD that had Alzheimer's pathology on. Um, and um, so those criteria which were published a few years ago have been very helpful for in clinical um, purposes and, and also in research of defining a syndrome um, which you know, we can be confident now, to backtrack a little bit, in, in Cambridge, we had been running a clinic and following up patients by the time I left for 17 years. And, and what we became aware of were um, more and more men who would come to this clinic and they'd keep coming back year after year and we had, who weren't changing. They weren't deteriorating and becoming demented or dying uh, they just sort of came to the clinic, and on each visit, their wives would say, oh, you know, he's terrible, he's, you know, disinhibited, uh, he spends more money, his, um, you know, his eating, his eating behavior is abnormal, um, he's apathetic, all the symptoms of FTD, but no progression. Uh, and our clinic was enriched with those people because most of the others had, had died off. Um, so we became interested in this syndrome of non-progressive FTD. So this shows um, patients who we called phenocopies of FTD, whose brains are normal, versus people with true FTD, whose brains look awful, either when they first present or within a year or two. And uh, we did a lot of research on that topic um, in Cambridge and um, in, in Sydney a few years ago. So we wanted to look at people who present with possible FTD to our clinic, um, who we were able to follow up, and we found that half of them, three years later, hadn't progressed, and they're in the sort of phenocopy category, but the other half had progressed. So we were interested 
uh, and quite a few of them had a gene mutation. So we were interested in, well, how can we choose, if when people first present with possible FTD and we're not certain, what are the clues um, that we can be a bit more certain? So uh, Emma found that a family history of dementia or motor neuron disease or psychosis was important and physical signs and there are also various neuropsychological um, clues early on. Um, but what we really need are more definitive measures that we can apply to patients when they first present. We either need sort of biological um, imaging, um, blood markers, or imaging markers. Now, like all other FTD groups around the world, we've done a great deal of brain imaging over the years, and we're now very lucky to have Raymond uh, leading this research, who's shown up here. And this is one of Raymond's studies in a group of patients. So all these wonderful scans that you see of FTD and Alzheimer's, they're all groups of patients who've been you know, amalgamated together and then compared to controls. And we can see changes in the brain in a group, both in the gray matter as shown here, and this is another longitudinal um, study done by um, Bonnie, uh, which showed a lot of white matter changes. But what we really need is some methodology that we can apply to single cases when they present um, to help us diagnose them. Now, Raymond and uh, his team have been, I hope, I think, uh, making a bit of a breakthrough in this area, which is very new. And Raymond has been applying this longitudinal single case methodology. And this is one patient who presented, and we didn't know whether he had FTD when he presented, and he's been scanned over five years or six years. And these are the areas of the brain that have shrunk, mainly the anterior temporal lobe in this case. And you can see this is the thickness of the cortex. So his cortex is shrinking. And what we're hoping is that we'll, we'll do a group of controls. We'll establish what the sort of limits of shrinkage are in cortical regions for controls. And we'll be able to say, well, there shouldn't be more than 0.5% shrinkage in one or two years. This patient has shown 5%, which is, you know, 10 times more than there should be. Um, and I know there are other groups in the world trying to do similar things. But it's interesting that given 15, 20 years of sophisticated imaging, um, you know, nobody else has come up with this as a method yet. Uh, this is a second case, a sporadic patient, um, who interestingly is showing shrinkage in a slightly different area in the orbital frontal cortex. And again, it didn't change much for two years, but then sort of started going down. And another important area of research um, has been in the, in the area of social cognition. So patients with FTD, I said, have, um, they're disinhibited, they're, um, they lose the ability to interact with people normally. Social rules, are, they, they make social transgressions. And, and this all falls under the umbrella of social cognition, which has become a very big topic in, in uh, neuropsychology and um, cognition. And um, we have looked at um, social cognition quite extensively. Patients with FTD fail on tests where they have to recognize emotion in faces, whether those are static faces as shown at the top or more dynamic uh, tasks. And uh, this is from a uh, task devised in Sydney by Sky McDonald, who I think I saw earlier, um, who uh, devised this very nice test for use in patients after traumatic brain injury, because they have problems with social cognition, as do patients with uh, um, psychiatric illnesses and schizophrenia as well. So patients with FTD show major problems with social cognition. Um, but I think in one of the more 
important studies that uh, Fiona led, we looked at longitudinal changes in um, social cognition. And you can see that patients with real FPD who are in green are really going downhill very quickly uh, compared to patients with Alzheimer's. Um, and so, again, another hope is that we'll have social cognitive tasks, a social cognitive battery that can be administered to patients when they present. Um, it may not be definitive on first administration, but when they come back a year later or two years, a year later, and we've shown kind of clear decline on that test, it'll be another marker for us that this is somebody with real FTD. Um, so I'm going to move from FTD into the other category of patients, those with uh, progressive aphasia, so the other side of the story, people with FTD that present with aphasia rather than behavioral change. Because this distinction between behavior and aphasic patients is rather arbitrary, and we often have difficulty deciding quite which box we're going to put people in, because most of the people with behavioral presentations develop some language problems, and most of the patients with language presentations develop some um, behavioral change. So there's a lot of overlap. Now, um, a few years ago, we had a nice distinction between of two types of progressive aphasia. We had those with problems, uh, a loss of knowledge of word meaning uh, and conceptual knowledge, presenting with naming problems, comprehension problems. Um, and uh, you know, over 20 years ago now, we did a lot of work delineating this syndrome uh, and the imaging. And then it gradually emerged that not only is this a distinctive clinical syndrome, it has its own pathology. They have a form of deposition of TDP that has its own signature. So it's a rather unique standalone syndrome. And the other aphasic patients really fell into a sort of hodgepodge of not semantic dementia. These were people with this fluent speech, tripping over words, um, distortion of their out language output, problems with the grammatical aspects of language and making speech errors, but they, they're not as clearly delineated as the semantic dementia cases. And as we develop, as more pathology emerged in these patients, we found that some of them had tau in the brain and some of them had Alzheimer's in the brain. And I remember very well, like over 20 years ago in Cambridge, probably you know, 25 years ago, we reported the first patient with PNFA and Alzheimer's and the experts in the world said, oh no, you know, that obviously wasn't a person with progressive aphasia, you know, you, you people in Cambridge can't diagnose anything right, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have called it that. But it, it's, it's gradually emerged that there sure enough are a group of aphasic pe people with Alzheimer pathology who present with aphasia. Uh, and the group of researchers in San Francisco have been very important in this area in, in splitting up these cases into the true non-fluence and the logopenics. Now, the, I, I can see a few eyelids getting heavy at this point on you know, the finer points of aphasic syndromes. Um, so I'm not going to, um, not going to go on about aphasias too much, uh, but I've got just a few observations. Again, one of the important contributions in the last few years, which I was part of, is coming up with international um, consensus criteria so that different groups around the world are applying the same criteria. And uh, this is a very, for those interested in progressive aphasia, this slide says everything that I think about it, really, that diagnosing semantic dementia is easy, or, or it should be, 
uh, that distinguishing the other two sorts can be tricky and uh, there's real problems uh, delineating between someone with Alzheimer's who's a bit aphasic and, and the logopenics. So um, we have done quite a lot of work in Sydney on um, these aphasic syndromes and one of the first things we did was come up with a new battery of tests because previously patients would have one test of naming and another test of comprehension and another test of repetition which would all be on different items and normed differently so we thought well what we need is a nice test that's quite quick to administer 30 items using modern color photography based on the same items in each test and we called it the SIDBAT for obvious reasons and uh, the patients have to name 30 items and then they have to point uh, to that like butterfly um, making it difficult amongst other insects and they have to do a comprehension test to know um, some of you might be wondering which which one goes with the butterfly you may not be keen lepidopterists here <laughs> but it is the net um, and finally to repeat the word and and sure enough um, diagnosing semantic dementia using this test uh, is super easy because they can repeat all the words uh, they can't name any of the pictures and they make a lot of errors on the comprehension test so it, it separates out semantic dementia very nicely it's not so good at separating out the other syndromes and uh, if there's any doubt and patients go off and have a scan there's a very characteristic pattern of atrophy in the inferior uh, temporal lobe and some work a few years ago um, when I was here on sabbatical that involved uh, Glenda uh, with was you know charting which bits of the temporal lobe were particularly affected and you can see this is a PET scan and what, what's so interesting about semantic dementia is that this is a PET scan and um, up here is normal so the, temp the parietal lobes and other parts of the brain are functioning normally and the temporal lobe isn't functioning at all it sort of you know, deactivates chops off functionally one bit of the brain or the rest is working normally so that's quite unlike Alzheimer's disease which is a very diffuse um, synaptic loss throughout the brain um, but there's a paradox in semantic dementia in that the brain looks like this and, and the hippocampi are here in the middle medial temporal lobe not working but they have very good episodic memory they remember their last visit to the uh, clinic and they remember you know if, if they come came to see me here they ask about you know how my kids were or how the pottery was going or you know they, they remember something from their previous visit and, and we've documented that in a number of ways so one of the great things uh, working with Glenda and you know expertise that we have or Glenda's lab have in quantitative neuropathology is that when we had collected enough brains um, we were able to look at this paradox of why is episodic memory so bad so good in semantic dementia so we we or Glenda's group quantified the neuronal <coughs> loss in all the bits of the brain to do with episodic memory so it's not just the hippocampus the hippocampus is connected you know to the mammillary bodies and the thalamus and the cingulate cortex so there's a whole circuit on the medial temporal lobe and what this shows is the percentage volume loss in different bits of the brain in semantic dementia there is more than 50 percent volume loss in the anterior hippocampus and we compared them with a group of behavioral variant FTD patients um, who also have bad episodic memory certainly by the time they die but what was very interesting is that the back end the body and the back end of the hippocampus is intact in semantic dementia as are other bits 
of the important memory circuit. Um, so we published that a few years ago. And uh, I, I put it in as an illustration of how we were able to address a, a cognitive issue using neuropathology and, and collecting these patients who've been well studied in life and collecting their brains and, and looking at them. Um, another thing um, I'll mention briefly um, to sort of really to illustrate the work of Murren Irish, um, who's done a lot of very important research in our group. Um, but patients with semantic dementia, um, they also have these social cognitive problems. They, they behave abnormally and robotically, and they lose empathy for other people, uh, and uh, they're difficult to live with. But it's difficult to test that because a lot of tests depend on verbal output. So what Murren did was use a test of cartoons um, where the, the cartoons were you know, meant to be, you had to understand a theory of mind to get these, um, these cartoons. And she showed that it was the right temporal lobe that was very important for, uh, for theory of mind. But I just put that in as a sort of you know, to highlight a lot of cognitive work that's gone on as well. Um, so, um, I talked about the, the SIDBAT that was very good for, de for delineating, sorting out semantic dementia from the other forms of aphasia, but not so good at distinguishing between the other kinds of progressive aphasia. And uh, Christian... Uh, who came from Chile um, quite a few, you know, eight years ago or so now, I think, and did his PhD. Um, I think I must have been feeling very sadistic or something when, when Christian started, because Christian's English at that time was not great, and I set him to work on progressive aphasia. <laughs> but his English has become fabulous now, and he's made very important contributions and is just back was just here at the moment interrupting to a two-year fellowship in Boston. So one of the things Christian did was come up with a, um, a, an algorithm for distinguishing between these true non-fluent cases and the logopenic cases with a rather simple algorithm of testing uh, and which we confirmed or we validated this by sending all the patients down to Melbourne for um, uh, amyloid scanning. And it was a remarkable experience for me because um, you know, we saw all these people, in the end we did over 100 that came to see us, and we said, well, we're, we're doing this research in, in Melbourne which helps us to tell whether there's Alzheimer pathology and you know, we're doing this scanning which is very good for Alzheimer pathology, but the, the downside is you have to go to Melbourne to have it and you have to be there the night before and have this scan. And, you know, it's not going to change the treatment, but it'd be helpful for our research. And they all signed up for it. You know, um, I mean, we paid for them and their spouse to go down. But nevertheless, you know, we had very high take up for, for going down and having um, this scanning in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, Christian also showed that in logopenic aphasia, there's this big swathe of abnormality in the, in the hemisphere, but different parts of that are responsible for different features of the syndrome, the naming problems and the repetition problems. Oh, now you get a bit of a breather and you can look at my pots. Um, so that's all, you know, I've talked about you know, diagnosing FTD and where we've got to and things to do with the behavioral form and getting better at diagnosing it and getting better at the aphasic syndromes. But what about these big questions then? You know, um, will our kids get it? So um, what have we done to help with that question? Well, FTD um, has been known for a long time to be quite familial. Um, compared to Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of 
debate in the literature about just how familial it is, and you read some papers, mainly from people doing genetics, who say, oh, 50% of people with um, FTD have a positive family history, you know, and, and then others say different things. But it all depends on what you regard as a positive family history. Um, we adopted this scale called the Goldman scale, which quantifies how familial a disease seems to be. And a score of one is having three relatives across two generations with a related disease. So that's heavy duty, you know, family history, down to uh, one family member with early onset dementia, or one family member with late onset dementia, or no affected relatives. And of course, the question about, you know, so we generally regard a score of one to three as being indicative of uh, an underlying genetic disorder. And you can see that the question about, well, how genetic is FTD, it depends very much on which kind of FTD, which syndrome are we talking about? Because people with behavioral variant FTD, 125, uh, a quarter of them have a strong family history. It's even stronger if people have FTD with motor neuron disease, and then it drops right down to around 5% for some of the other syndromes. So straight away when we see patients with semantic dementia, you know, the likelihood of it being a genetic disorder is very low, and the likelihood of behavioral variant FTD being genetic is quite high. There are a number of genes which are associated with um, FTD, and some of them are very, contribute very little, like this one up here, which is really confined to Den, you know, families in Denmark. Um, these two, uh, this one was discovered quite a few years ago, but isn't so common. And then about 2006, I think, this one was found. But together, they contribute, um, they don't mop up most of the cases with a positive family history. The big breakthrough was in 2011, finding this expansion in the gene known as the C9RF72 mutation, which is by far the commonest genetic mutation. Um, and since then, groups around the world have been screening all their patients. And um, so this is a comparative study of mixed FTD patients from Philadelphia, and this is our results. Now, what we've found is that patients with behavioral variant FTD who have a very strong family history, so they're in that one or two category, all have a gene mutation that we've found. As the strength of family history drops off, um, there's, it lessens and drops right off. Um, so straight away, by taking a detailed family history in people with behavioral variant FTD, we can predict that there's likely to be a gene and that we're going to find it now if it's, a, if it's a one or two. So there are 125 of these patients, and we found um, a quarter of them have a mutation. But all the other groups of patients combined, we find very few. We found only 12 out of nearly 300 so mutations in the other syndromes uh, are very uncommon. And some very new data, um, and uh, this is work being led by John Kwok in collaboration with our group, um, doing next generation sequencing. So that's looking at all the known exomes or the whole genome. And we've done a couple of studies looking for uh, mutations and I've extracted this data. And it depends whether you think you're a sort of glass half full or half empty person. So even using this sophisticated screening all the genes for any mutation, if there's no positive family history, you find very few mutations, one or two. And this one, we've one of, there's a mutation discovered in one of our patients that we didn't think was going to have one. There's a negative family history. And I looked at his file, and interestingly, this is somebody who's lost contact with their family completely. 
So they, you know, there's, it's an unknown family history rather than a negative. Um, but I'm sure that we will be hearing a lot more about more sophisticated um, gene screening techniques. Now, if we just go back here, you can see by far the commonest mutation in our group of patients is this C9ORF gene. There are 27 of them compared to just four of the others. And this turns out to be a very interesting um, mutation and syndrome clinically because um, we noticed uh, that we noticed in Cambridge before we knew the mutation, but then you know, here um, we looked at it again and we found um, a high proportion so here we have a group of patients with FTD or motor neuron disease, all of whom were screened for this mutation. And we found 14 of them compared to 42 without it. And those with the mutation have a very high rate of psychosis. A half of them have psychotic symptoms. And often those psychotic symptoms have been occurring for a number of years before they present to us making the diagnosis very difficult because people have thought that it's schizophrenia and other diagnoses. And not only do they have psychotic symptoms, they're, they're quite severe, persistent psychotic symptoms compared to people who sporadic cases do have psychotic symptoms, but they're, they're quite mild. And when we were doing this research, we observed that we were finding, oh, oh, just before I say that, um, well, we looked at which bits of the brain seem to be correlating with the psychotic symptoms. And uh, in keeping with some of the literature in schizophrenia, we find these dorsolateral frontal, and particularly the thalamus seems to be important in the genesis of psychotic symptoms. Uh, and the thalamus is involved early in this disease. But when we were looking at psychotic symptoms in our patients, and, and Emma was taking histories from them, we noticed that quite a few of our patients reported psychosis in family members who hadn't been diagnosed with dementia, but had been diagnosed with, with psychosis. So we thought, well, this is worthy of looking at um, in, in some detail. Um, so Emma heroically obtained information on 1,414 uh, family members by applying a, a standardized psychiatric interview to an informative family member. Uh, so we were interested in first and second degree relatives. And what we found, sure enough, was a much higher rate than you would expect of uh, psychosis in the relatives of our patients. And so late onset psychosis, that you might think, well, these are people about to develop dementia. They're developing psychosis in their 50s or whatever. But we also found a high rate of young onset regular schizophrenia in, our, in the C9 carriers families. And uh, I was keen to include autism because I've noticed that several of our families had come in and said, oh, do you think it's relevant that uh, my daughter's child has just been diagnosed with autism? Uh, and I spoke to Bruce Miller about this some years ago. He said, oh, yeah, we've got some families like that as well, and I've wondered. So we included a screen for autism. And we did find also uh, an association with uh, autism, but it's not as strong as the, these others. So um, we would argue that this gene seems to not only cause FTD in later life, it seems to be important as a risk factor for psychiatric illnesses and even developmental disorders like autism and schizophrenia. Um, and um, so our approach to uh, gene screening has been helped by all this research which is really, you know, taking a very full history, including FTD, dementia, MND, and psychiatric illnesses. Um, 
there's probably no need to screen people with progressive aphasia unless there's a very strong family history for genetic abnormalities. Um, but um, people with behavioral variant and FDD, MND should definitely see a genetic counselor, which is our policy at the moment. And in fact, because we can't quite, you know, two years assess people, we don't know which category we're going to put them in. So all the patients see a genetic counselor before we take blood um, because uh, of these findings. So the second big question, how bad is it? What's the outlook? Um, you know, what can we expect? And uh, Aneda, who I mentioned earlier, who's an occupational therapist, did a lot of work on this. Um, we thought we needed a matrix of, of tests to judge severity that would be behavioral and cognitive and would include brain imaging, and we'd sort of combine all of that. But that turned out to be far too complex. And actually, all of these dementias impair activities of daily living. You're either having problems using the telephone and paying your bills because you're aphasic, or you're having difficulty doing that because you've got frontal lobe problems. So all these cognitive abilities um, affect everyday life. And so this is basically a scale on, based on everyday behavioral abilities, which we looked at in a complex way called, called the RASH analysis. So we can derive scores and we can segregate people into mild, moderate, or severe, so that when patients come to us and we've assessed them, we can say that it's mild or it's early moderate. And this scale also shows very robust changes over time. Hardly anybody gets better in a couple of years. They either stay more or less the same or get worse. So it's a very good scale for detecting change and correlates very well with the degree of burden that the carers and the families are experiencing. So this is a way that we, when we see somebody once, we see them the next time, how much have they moved on this scale? Are they looking like a fast decliner or a slow decliner to give the family some indication of the prognosis? Going back in time a bit, when I was here in 2002, and uh, Glenda and I looked at, uh, with Jill Frill, uh, we looked at survival in people who come to the brain bank in Sydney and Cambridge. And we showed um, that there wasn't much difference between the clinical syndromes, except those who develop motor neuron disease and go downhill very quickly. Uh, but within each of these, there's very wide variation. So some people that present go downhill, a couple of years they're in a nursing home. Others are deteriorating quite slowly and eight or ten years they're, late, they're in a nursing home. So quite recently, um, a, a research fellow who was here from Cambridge um, was looking at survival um, in FTD. And so when people present to us, can we give them a better indication of their outlook and we, this, this was based on 75 patients. And we found that when people present, if they've got a short history already, and they've only been, the family only noticed problems a year or two ago, that's bad, you know, because they all reach it at a sort of certain stage. Whereas if the family noticed problems six years ago, that's good in terms of prognosis. The degree of frontal atrophy, the older patients, those with a lot of behavioral scores, and those who had a have a gene abnormality all deteriorated more quickly. Um, one of the things that we've investigated a lot in um, FTD is the eating behaviors that these patients show. And in a moment, I'll bring that back to the relevance of survival. But patients with FTD, it's a very characteristic feature that the families report that they overeat and they crave sweet food and sometimes quite difficult for the families to control. And uh, Rebecca, 
Ahmet completed her PhD on this and did some remarkable work with Sadaf Farouki, who leads the Genetic Obesity Unit in Cambridge. And they have this very nice test they apply to their children with genetic obesity and they're doing various interventions, which we adapted. So our patients all came in um, and we told them we were going to take blood the, next, the day first when they came in and they had to be fasting overnight and we would take blood and then we would say, well, we don't know what you like for breakfast, but here's a whole array of food that you might like and leave them alone on their own in a room. And we say, well, we're just going to take the husband and wife away. Have what you like. And we leave them for half an hour. And there are very high calorie things, the sort of things I like, unfortunately, you know, donuts and, and um, uh, you know, frosties. And then there are healthy options. That stuff you don't want to touch, apples and muesli. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so we'd leave them to help themselves and then come back. And obviously we knew what was what was uh, missing. You might have to frisk the patients in case they'd filled their pockets with food for later as well. And what we found, and you re rarely get this sort of result in behavioral or neuropsychology, what we found was that every behavioral variant patient, about 20 of them, exceeded any of the others. They all eat kind of a huge amount relative to normals in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And we also looked at their sweet preference. So these are three versions of eaten mess, which, are, it's, which is always sweet. And so we had a sweet form of it, a sweeter form, and a horrendously sweet form. And they had to say, judge the sweetness level, which is down here, which they were normal at doing. They could say, you know, how sweet it was. But then we said, well, which ones do you like? And the FTD patients love the super sweet one and tuck into it and say, oh, can I have some more later? You know, whereas you and I would be saying, oh my God, that's so sweet. So uh, Rebecca did that work, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, but we also did a lot of other work, which uh, Olivier started uh, with uh, on MRI showing that the hippocampus is the hypothalamus is shrinking. And with Glenda, we looked at post-mortem brains and Rebecca's gone on to look at the impact of all this overeating, which is, uh, it, has, it has effects on insulin, triglycerides. Um, so there are widespread metabolic effects. But what we thought was odd was, well, these patients are eating a lot, um, and they've, but they're not all that fat. You know, they're not getting super fat, so there's something else going on. Maybe they're high, you know, they're, they have high metabolism. So we also did some research using these actimetry monitors that you wear for a week, and it looks at your heart rate, um, it looks at your sleeping heart rate, and it looks at your activity. And sure enough, they are hypermetabolic. They have elevated heart rates. Um, so they, they eat a lot, but they're also hypermetabolic. And to our surprise, we thought, well, um, we'll just have a look at, you know, survival um, in related to overeating. And contrary to our predictions, the overeating seems to be protective and help. So the patients who, who eat more live longer. Now, this is just one study which needs replicating, but it seems to have... Um, there's some very complex thing going on about regulation of appetite, eating, and uh, brain neuron survival. So we have got somewhere in predicting severity and progression. And that brings us to the slightly gloomy topic of, is there a treatment? Well, the answer is no. Um, and here we're dealing with a difficult disease, and everybody here will know the zillions of dollars that have been spent on trying to treat Alzheimer's disease, which in some ways is a much simpler condition to treat, and there are better early markers, and there have been some very promising drugs in, in mice, immunotherapies, and 
um, amyloid drugs which haven't worked. Here, we're faced with multiple syndromes and pathology, um, including Alzheimer's mimicking um, FTD. Um, and sometimes when people present for the first time, you know, they can walk in and talk to you and their brain looks like this, um, which is horrendous. So there's already very severe neuronal loss when people present. So um, it's going to be an up uphill task coming up with, with therapies that attack the biology. But that doesn't mean we can't help the patients in, in some way and help the families. Um, and one of the things that I just thought I would um, illustrate is that semantic dementia, I showed you how confined it is to the temporal lobes. So the rest of the brain is working quite well. And it actually has a much slower course than some of the other diseases. So you can use their preserved cognitive abilities to try and compensate for what they're losing. Uh, and Sharon did her uh, PhD with us a few years ago and is now in the UK using techniques of word relearning, which were very effective and generalized um, and were sustained. The problem is that it was quite time intensive uh, and tailored per case that she interacted with and did this, this work. But I believe she's presenting at the FTD conference, talk or a poster, on at last getting the technique that she used online so that people can potentially, we can you know, treat people remotely using these techniques. So maybe treatment options are the final frontier rather than just frontier. And uh, in a few years' time, we'll hear all about that. And um, I can't finish without a little advertisement for our family-run cafe in Cambridge that my son is the manager of. That's my son there. And uh, my wife, Carol, organizes all the art. And I make the pots. And um, so it's a real family affair, our cafe. So everyone must go there um, when they're in Europe or follow us on social media. So I will stop and uh, um, answer any questions, I think, for a few minutes, yeah? Um, thanks for an excellent presentation. Why do they have such a high metabolic rate? Well, we, I don't, we don't know. I mean, it, it's, a whole, it's a relatively new area of research. That, um, and one of the spin-offs from this, which I haven't really had a chance to talk about, is that like other groups in the world, we're particularly interested because of this mutation this one mutation is much commoner, is looking at the at-risk family members who may carry, be carrying that mutation but not yet develop the, you know, dementia and wondering whether these metabolic signatures and changes are occurring really early or whether they're a late manifestation of the disease and what, what's causing that. But... Uh, there's autonomic disturbance in, in uh, FTD. We, we have looked at symptoms related to uh, the other things that the autonomic nervous system uh, control, like gut and bladder, uh, and sexual dysfunction in men is, is very common. Um, so there's, there's a lot of autonomic disturbance, is all I can say. All dumbfounded. Thank you, John, for the excellent uh, overview. Um, what keeps me intrigued, and I think you too, is why is FTD so much 
focal? Why only frontal temporal lobes? Even yeah. if we know about the mutations and the yeah. proteins, why, for example, only in the temporal poles yeah. and semantic dementia? Well, you know, um, that when somebody sort of cracks that question, they'll be on, on the plane to Stockholm, I think. Um, because, you know, why does Huntington's disease, which is a gene mutation, affect the chordate nucleus? Why does FGD present? Um, and I'm getting into tricky territory here, but I, but I think although each cell has the same set of genes, their sort of expression and modification and uh, what's happening sort of post-gene genomically is, is very different across. And so all one can say is, well, it may be, um, you know, a gene mutation, but those cells that are deteriorating in FGD must be very distinct and susceptible to that, either that. Now, why, you know, but it's fascinating that a gene mutation or several gene mutations can cause the same syndromes in the same bits of the brain that are not, that non-genetic diseases can present with. And that's all, you know, a great mystery. Um, but other people much cleverer than me will be needed to address that. So thank you very much. I appreciate your presentation very much. What is your concept about these uh, MRI cases which you show that very severely atrophic and the patients come very lately? You said, do you think that the families recognize the subtle yeah. symptoms late? Sure. Or you think that other circuits overtake yeah. it or compensate? Or? A, a, bit, a bit of both of those, I think. Um, I think there's a lot of redundancy, thankfully, in the brain. And so you can have a, a, you know, a great deal of cellular loss and deterioration with other bits compensating until some critical moment when a little bit more pathology tips people over the edge. Um, I think there's a lot of variation in what families pick up. Um, and it's notable that the... the the sort of prelude, the, the pre-diagnostic period is much less in the aphasias than it is in the behavioral cases. So I think the patients are noticing word finding problems and vocabulary problems and they present earlier. The behavioral cases, um, the patients are unaware. Um, you know, they can sometimes start thinking there's a conspiracy against them and they don't want to go to be assessed. Um, and, um, you know, those, it, it's occurring at a time of life when people are ending their jobs and careers and they've got troublesome teenagers and it's put down to late life and depression and things. And it takes a long time to... You know, there usually has to be some quite severe behavioral problem um, before the penny finally drops and, you know, they're forced along. And then, you know, they go and see a, a GP and a specialist who doesn't really know about FGD. And, you know, so the people we see have been in the med... You know, there's a period of non-contact with the medical system, then quite a long period of going around different specialists and coming to see us. So... Um, a number of reasons. What do you think is going to end up being the answer for the FTD phenocopy? Well, they are fascinating. You know, they're, they're, that's the thing that's fascinated me over over the years. Um, what's going on? Um, there's there's definitely. The sort of new wife syndrome, uh, which illustrates something about these people, because um, they come along and the wives say, oh, you know, he's terrible, he doesn't change his underwear, and he spends all his time in the garage tinkering with his car, and, you know, um, he's not affectionate to me anymore. And, uh, but then you find out that actually they met on the internet, and met a few times and got married two years ago, and there was a sort of honeymoon phase, and then these symptoms were noticed. And you bring in the brother, 
And they say, oh, no, he's always been like that. That's why his first wife left him, you know. And uh, he's, you know, always spent his life in the garage and doesn't care about anything. Um, so um, that's a roundabout way of saying, well, I think there is a proportion of these people that have personality uh, disorders that are in the Asperger spectrum or the kind of OCD spectrum. Um, some of them, though, there isn't um, a lifelong, and it, it's probably, you know, sort of various life stressors that, that have gone on in people decompensating. And, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, what I'm describing is a typical teenager, isn't it, really? You know, they don't care about anybody. You know, they spend all the money they've got. You know, they don't change their underpants. And, uh, you know, and um, so really it's a sort of regression to a teenage state. And uh, some people may be just vulnerable to that under life stresses. Uh, um, but these are all, you know, speculations. Uh, when that gene was discovered, the C9 ORF, which can be very tricky because some of those patients have a long psychiatric history, we thought, oh, you know, all these phenocopy patients, we've all these people we've called phenocopies in Cambridge, they've probably all got the C9 mutation. But we managed eventually to screen all the bloods we'd saved, and we found one out of a dozen or something like that that was positive, the others weren't. So occasionally that gene mutation can catch you out. But what, what's wrong with all the others, I don't know. But they're interesting and difficult. Um, John, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. It's great to be here to hear your talk. Um, you've emphasized quite a lot of the genetics. And so I was just wondering about some of the other factors and what you think about those. So sort of for sort of multiple reasons. So my understanding is that some of the genetic changes like C9-off are actually quite common in the population, and but you don't get you know, mm. the, the disease in the same way for people. And also many of these, like semantic dementia, there seems to be no. no. So do you have any sense of, can we make any progress yeah. on environmental triggers or no. other factors that flip well, people? Well, I think one of the problems is that, you know, those epidemiological studies that have been done in Alzheimer's that show an association with earlier brain trauma, for instance, um, they involve very large numbers of, of patients. And I think, to be honest, we haven't done proper epidemiology, which would really require collaboration across several large centers with, with lots of people. There, there, there's a bit of that, and we, we entered data from Cambridge into a, um, an epidemiological study on occupation and you know, urban, rural pesticides smoking, all those things, and nothing really emerged. I mean, you know Marcel Mesulam has proposed that at least a proportion of the progressive aphasics have pre-existent developmental language problems that maybe they compensated for, and then, you know, that's a vulnerability factor. Um, but we really don't have many clues as to what the other factors are. Um, I'm not sort of super hopeful because, you know, there have been huge epidemiological studies in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. We haven't come up with that much, you know, that, that are risk factors. Um, the thing about the C9R, well, it, it is certainly unclear as to whether you could lead, lead a, a full, normal, healthy life and die in your 80s and never develop FGD or schizophrenia. Um, I think the baseline rate of the expansion is actually very low um, when people screen, you know, large blood samples. They don't come, they, it, it's not something that pops up all the time. And you can see when we screened, you know, a couple of hundred people without a family history, we weren't finding it. Um, so a lot of, lot, of, lot of work for people to do there. I'll take the chair prerogative for the last question. Um, you've been working on it for ages. Too long. And, well, and yeah. it's been remarkable 
advances, possibly more so than other dementia syndromes that have been um, being researched alongside. So for this, even though it's complex, I mean, you've shown us just the tip of the iceberg mm. as a complexity, so we know so much more. If you had to predict the, the, um, with the rate of, of uh, findings that we have and with, with the growing dementia um, funding and people concentrating on it, are we, going, are we going to get closer and how fast is it going to be? Um, well, it's certainly true that... Um, you know, we knew practically nothing about FTD, you know. Even when you came, 2002. <laughs> yeah. <In laughs> I 2000, mean, we were doing biology that really was not out there. you know, yeah. we were pioneering in, the, in, in the pa our papers then. Uh, and since then, the escalation of publication across the world has been huge. And, you know, we've certainly learned a great deal about the sort of biology, the genetics, the imaging, um, you know, all the cognition studies, which I... Have, you know, tip of the iceberg. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get better at, you know, knowing what the pathology is when people present to us by a combination of, you know, clinical methods, perhaps, you know, um, better PET ligands for identifying, you know, specific pathologies, and uh, possibly some other CSF or, or blood markers and some combination of those. So we'll be very much better at, you know, characterizing which pathology. There are all these drugs that the, it, it's good for us that the Alzheimer field have moved from amyloid drugs into tau drugs. So there are all these anti-tau immunotherapies that are being tried out. Um, and so they could be of of benefit to us, at least in some of these syndromes, let's say, for instance, PSP, which, you know, we could embrace into FTD, which we know those patients all have tau. So perhaps some of those drugs will be of benefit to the patients who have a lot of symptoms but not a lot of pathology. I'm not so hopeful about therapies once people present to us with terrible looking brains mm, mm, mm. Um, but who knows you know the rate of escalation of knowledge and new drugs and things is pretty immense mm. so we've all got to keep working on it yeah, exactly.